What's up, everybody? Welcome to BioS3 Raw TV. Well, um, you guys see this video. This is actually not going to be about Callum per se, like digging on him or going to town on him. Like this has nothing to do with um, Callum's actions per reporting what's going on. This is not a report. What I want to do is give you guys some clarity um, about this topic. And um, let's back up and go to the beginning. So this weekend, I was away at the Pittsburgh Championships, and I really wasn't aware of what was going on. So my boy Miro, you guys might know him. He's the best man on AEW Wrestling. Miro, I used to be uh, WWE Rusev was his name, the Bulgarian Brute or the Bulgarian Beast, whatever the Bulgarian Smashing Machine, whatever. They used to call him a bunch of things. But anyways, Miro actually sent me the article about Callum um, jumping out of the window. And, of course, people rushed right away to make the videos about it and talk about it. And Nick Trigilli is usually the one that's on the scene first with these things. Johnny Bravo made one based on, you know, Nick's. And then I saw, I think, Nick's Strength and Power made one. People started popping up with him, and I watched them. And they were pretty much all um, talking about the same things, just reporting what happened. Now, I did watch the follow-up um, of Nick Trigilli, because, again, Nick's usually on top of these things first before anybody else is. So I watched his follow-up last night. And I got to tell you that I disagree very strongly with Nick. And I'm going to speak today from personal experience, okay, and tell you guys... Um, really, really from a perspective of Callum, what's going on right now. And it does appear to me that Callum is addicted to drugs. It looks like it is methamphetamine. Um, cocaine and methamphetamine were both found in his possession in uh, the last time I heard he got in trouble. He was caught with steroids, meth, uh, methamphetamine, and um, cocaine. So he's on these speedy drugs. Now, here's the thing. Nobody just does meth. Nobody gets up one morning and says, I'm going to do meth. Some people try cocaine randomly out of the blue to a club or a bar or something. Somebody has some, but... Meth is one of those drugs, like, that's something I've never tried. And I've done just about every drug out there, right? I've never done meth. It's just something that never appealed to me. It was gross to me. It was something that I really didn't know where to find it. But honestly, even if I could have found it, I probably wouldn't have tried it anyways. Because it's just that it, it has this stigma. Even a heroin addict's meth has this stigma to it. So anyways, so I'm watching this thing and um, I see Nick talk about, um, you know, Callum's post that he puts up about how his parents turn his back on him. His friends turn his back on him. Let's pump the brakes for a second here. Now, Nick, um, in one of his videos, claims to have been around people that were addicted and people that had drug problems. Hang on. I am a recovering heroin addict, okay? Many of my friends are dead, or some of them are still even in jail from the stuff that we used to do back in the day. I have seen drug addiction. I have lived it. I have worked through it. And it's been 21 years this year, clean. 21 years clean and sober from opiates without a single relapse. So trust me, guys, I know exactly what I'm talking about, and I know where Callum's at right now. So Callum's friends and family have backed off from him because they have no choice at this point. Now, what Nick was saying was, oh, you know, if it was my kid, I'd lock him in a room. Go ahead, lock him in a room all you fucking want. All you're going to do is kill him. That's all that's going to happen. His parents were allowing him to live there, right, at this place of residence, where it is, with this property, whatever. They were allowing him to live there. They took him back in because he had a problem. And what happens is when you do that, you're now facilitating that problem to get even worse, right? You're encouraging that. You're enabling that individual to get worse and worse and worse. The addiction feeds off that. So the more you enable them, the longer that addiction feeds, the worse it gets for the individual until they fucking die, period. So your friends, family, everybody starts to walk away from you. They back up. And, you know, uh, right now... Um, Nick is talking about rock bottom. Well, rock bottom wouldn't have happened for Callum if they didn't throw him out of the house, right? Nick's saying, well, once you hit rock bottom, listen, I've hit rock bottom. You have to have nowhere else to go but up. And if Callum was living with his parents or living on his parents' property and his friends and family were taking care of him, that's not rock bottom, okay? That's enabling. That's a completely different thing. And there's a lot of people, and Nick, by, by, by saying what he was saying is a very common thing. Right? It's a very common thing that you want to help and you want to be the ones that save them and you love them and you care about them, but you can't. You're not a professional. It doesn't matter how long you lock them up in a room for. You can detox the shit out of them in a room. They'll come out completely clean. I guarantee fucking to you within two weeks, that person gets high again and nine out of ten times, they go back to using the same amounts they did before they dried out and they overdose and die because they want to get really fucking high and they're like, I'll just do it this one time because I'm in control now. And they go back to that dose, even if they don't go back to that dose, when they go back in that drug, the receptors in the brain, re they recognize it. They're going to look for it for the rest of his life, and they go through the whole fucking process again. So no, you can't just lock them up and detox them. The whole thing is you go detox and then counseling and in therapy to learn what the reason is why you're doing it. 
Callum has to understand why he's taking these drugs to be able to quit. And what's happening right now is he's playing the, oh, poor me, like my parents kicked me out, my friends don't want anything to do with me. Why? It's because of your actions. They took you back in. They gave you another chance. But what happens is his parents show up and the entire place is trashed. Now, one of two things happen with that. And Nick talked about the individuals you get messed around, you get mixed up with messing around with drugs. I'm going to talk about them in a second because I know that firsthand. So when the parents show up and their drug addict son who they have allowed to come home, who continues to get in trouble, right? They allowed him to live there. He continues to get in trouble with the machete, chopping up the seat in the guy's car. He gets caught with drugs. They come and find this place trash. One of two things happened. Either people that were after him for money or whatever the case may be came there and trashed it, right? Looking for something like money or something of value. Or Callum was high himself and trashed it. So one of those two things happened. Now, number one, if it was somebody that showed up, that family's now in danger. These people don't stop at the individual that's fucked them over that's on drugs. These people that are that are involved with the drugs go after your family, anybody you care about because they want their fucking money. They don't really want to hurt you because you're paying them. They don't want to lose you as a customer because you're indebted to them for whatever now and you're going to keep coming back because you're addicted. So they don't want to hurt you. They'll beat the shit out of you, but they're not going to kill you. But they'll kill one of your family members. So his parents show up, find this place trashed. Either your drug addict son doesn't respect your property and shit enough to keep your stuff clean and not fuck it up. Or people are after him enough to where they'll destroy that and they're going to be coming after you sooner or later anyway. So what is his parents to do? Take a fucking bullet because their kid's on drugs? No, you kick him the fuck out. He's old enough. He's on his own. You get fucking help. There are places to get help. I had to go through this whole entire fucking process. Right? So you see, it's not about his parents just like, getting sick of him. It's like they cannot help him. They have been enabling him. And any therapist, any fucking therapist, anybody addiction specialist will tell you, you cannot treat your family members, your friends, yourself. You're not an expert. You don't understand the shit. You want to help them by grabbing them and holding on to them and trying to save them. That's the worst thing. That enables that addiction to keep rising to new levels, hurting more people and more collateral damage happens. Like your only course of action is to kick him the fuck out, shut his phone off, kick him the fuck out, let him live outside for a few days, let him have a coming to uh, to God, right? We're coming to God to realize that I'm fucked. They have nothing. There's no that's rock bottom. So what happens is they throw him out. He goes to his friend's house, right? Somebody else enabled him. Oh yeah, come live with me, no problem. He goes over there, gets high over there, and then whatever happens, jumps out a fucking window there and smashes his fucking body on the cement and fucks his spine up. That's rock bottom. Rock bottom was situation after situation, chance after chance. If he had stayed at his friend's house and didn't jump out the window, he would continue to do drugs, continue to get worse, and he would have fucking died. That is what is going to fucking happen. He's on that path. There's no sign of him stopping. There's no sign of him slowing down. Every month we keep hearing about him, keep hearing about him getting worse and worse and worse. Okay? So he's on that destruction, destructive path to destruction or self-destruction. And there isn't anybody going to be able to stop it but him. And he doesn't realize that right now because he's too fucking far gone. Now, I do believe that, yes, the career has something to do with it. I do think his kid has something to do with it. I do think the amount of money he has to pay for child support. I think these all these things are playing into why he went off the deep end because he basically lost his entire identity. He's no longer a competitor. He's no longer, you know, technically, he was still in the fitness industry. He was doing some acting and stuff, but he had these injuries, couldn't bring back that physique. Next thing you know, he's got a kid, which he's got a whole new responsibility for. The payments that come with that, he no longer has the money to play with motorcycles and fucking whatever the other shit he was doing, which he was always doing some kind of crazy shit. His whole life got flipped upside down. And rather than being a fucking, you know, sitting there and going, I need to figure this shit out. I'm going to go to a counselor to figure this out. He turned to drugs to mask it. And what he did was got himself hooked. And now he's fucking off and running. And all the other shit doesn't matter. Like bodybuilding doesn't matter to him. I guarantee his kid doesn't matter to him. His fucking, the money is something that matters to him because he's in the spot right now where he has nothing. He's fucking homeless. He's surfing on fucking couches while he's in the hospital. But he's homeless at this point. You have a guy that was at the top of the world about two years ago, at the very pinnacle of our, 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 our industry, the top of the world, had everything, had his whole life, had the world wrapped around his finger, destroyed to being homeless, addicted to drugs, not paying his fucking child support. He's got warrants in America, warrants in fucking Australia. He's getting in trouble with the law. His parents have kicked him out. That's all within two years. That's what drugs do to you. Or I should say that's what... Life circumstances can do to you when you don't deal with it the proper way. Now, going back to, um, you know, his parents find him in that situation. His parents find the, the, the place all fucked up and tore up. And they're like, well, fuck, we're in danger now, right? And he's acting erratically, right? When he goes on social media and blasts his parents like that, he's being an addict, doing what addicts do, right? They try to gain the trust of other people 
But he's like, woe is me. Why did they kick you out? You destroyed their property. Why did you destroy their property? You're on drugs and you're a fucking idiot. My, oh, my friends are walking away from me. Why the fuck are they walking away from me? Because they tried to help you and realized you're getting worse. We're not doing fucking well because we are not doctors. We're not addiction specialists. So these motherfuckers, they either continue to do that, enable him, and he dies. Or they back off and go, this is not my problem. It's important for the, the parents and the friends to distance themselves so the parents and the friends get well. Because they're not well right now. When you're taking care of an addict, you're not well. You're just as wrapped up in their addiction as they are. So at this point, his addiction has now been collateral damage and interfered with his friends and family's lives and his parents' lives. His addiction is affecting people like a fucking virus spreading very quickly. And these people, in order to save themselves, need to distance themselves. And they should get therapy themselves to understand what's happening right now. And I'm, I'm sure they are because they kicked him out and everybody's distanced themselves. But somebody somewhere got to them and told them, this is what has to happen for him to survive. Not even to get clean, but to survive. He's not going to survive this, right? So you get to that point now. Jerry, well, well, how do you know all this stuff? Well, I went through this. I went through all this. You know, there was a point where there was um, a person who was selling drugs, and I owed him some money, and um, he threatened my family first. It was my, my parents, my brother, then my wife. And the thing that really broke me was my dog. He was going to break my dog's legs. They're not going to hurt me. They're going to hurt everybody around me. So now here I am trying to figure out I'm addicted to drugs, I'm trying to figure out how to protect my family, get all this money together, still keep my drug addiction going. This is what happens as a drug addict, right? So I tell him, what if I beat the fuck out of you? Will you clear the slate? I'm like, if I just beat, and I had plans just to beat the fuck out of this guy with a brick, a hammer, whatever. Whatever it took me to fuck this guy up is what I was going to do. And he laughed at me. I said, okay, motherfucker. So I actually went to a friend's house. This is completely true. My right hand to God, this is a true story. You guys know I'm actually very spiritual and religious. So I go to my friend's house who had actually done time for murder before. And I went in there I, and he would, I don't want to give too many details because I don't want to give anybody any ideas. But I said, I want to take this guy out. Like, I want to kill him. And he literally sat me down. This guy was my dope dealer. He was my heroin dealer. He sat me down. And this guy had so much respect for me. I, and he kept selling me the heroin and kept saying stuff like, I wish we could hang out and you were clean. Like, I really like you and like to hang out with you. But you're such a fucking mess. So he sat me down. And he said, listen to me. He said, uh. This isn't the life for you, bro. He said, you're going to get caught. He said, I'm just telling you right now. You're not going to get away with this. It's too small of a town. He said, so you will get caught. He said, you got to do the time. He goes, and that's not for you. Like, you're not a murderer. And I'm like, I don't fucking care. I'm like, fuck this guy. I was just losing. I'm like, I'm, I'm never going to be away from this guy. I got to fucking, you know, I'll never be free. I got to fucking take him out. And he said, all right, go home. That's what I want you to do. He said, go home and take a night and sleep on it. He said, when you come back tomorrow, come back, you know, in the afternoon, not in the morning when you wake up, come back in the afternoon. When you come back. If you still want to do this, I will help you. We will take this motherfucker out. You're going to do it, but I'll help you do it so you know how to do it. Cool. So I go home and I did. I calmed down. I came to his house the next day and I said, listen, man, I said, you were right. I said, what do I do? He said, well, here's your options. You either, you know, do what you wanted to do there. You can try fighting him. That's not going to work, right? Because eventually he's going to heal up and come after you anyways. You can pay him. He's like, or you can go talk to him and try to figure this shit out. He's like, my bet is you go talk to him and try to figure this shit out. He's like, pawn some shit, and borrow some money, do whatever you got to do. He's like, just get it. It wasn't a lot of money. I forgot how much it was, but it was like under $1,000. It wasn't crazy. And um, so I did. I went and I kind of worked this thing out. And the whole time in the back of my head thinking, like, you have no idea. I almost took a fucking hammer to your skull. Like, in that state of mind I was in, this guy has no idea how close. Because he had no idea. I was just playing. A, he thought I was going to beat him up. And realistically, I was going to show up and kill him with a fucking hammer. Like, that's where my head was at. And it was... Without that, my, my friend that was actually my dope dealer telling me to go home and not do this, then I probably wouldn't be sitting here today making this video. So I know 100% what the fuck is going on, where this goes next, and what's going to happen if he doesn't snap out of this and realize he's fucked. You know, I went through all the same stuff. Most of my friends had backed away. My parents threw me out. My parents threw me out of the house, me and my girlfriend at the time. We were doing ketamine and all kinds of other shit. And they threw us out. They said, not in our house. We've had enough. Get the fuck out. So we drove to a motel. We drove straight to a motel, continued the party. And while we were at that party doing that, my mom, being smart enough to say, they didn't get very far because they're too fucked up, drove by, saw where the car was. And like, they went to the fucking motel. So, okay, whatever. So she called the police. Called the police on us. I had already been out of the house. Called the police and said, we need to do a wellness check. And, uh. Police knocked on the door. I opened the door and I knew the cop. I knew him. He went to the gym and I was standing there all high as fuck with blood running down my arms from shooting ketamine. 
And I'm like, hey. And he's like, Jerry, what the fuck? He's like, what's going on? I said, no, we're just kind of hanging out. And he's like, my girlfriend was on the bed, like all passed out. He's like, uh, you know, I had a needle in my hand. He goes, put the needle on the table. So I put it on the table. He's like, where are the drugs? I said, they're in the pillow under her head. Like, I was so high, I didn't even care. I was just like, hey, I'm like, how's, how's everything going? How have you been? I haven't seen you in a while. And he comes in, he's like, fuck. So he gets the drugs, he sits me down, calls another officer, and they came in and they arrested us. We went to jail that night. And um, we got interrogated, so like, where the fuck did you get this shit? It wasn't even illegal at the time, ketamine. It wasn't a, a controlled substance, but it was still a drug, and we were injecting it on, um, like, uh, the owner of the hotels or the motel, like, in their property, which they didn't want, so... Technically, we were breaking the law. And at the time, I don't think needles were legal. So you could even get busted just for having a, um, an insulin needle. And um, they went through everything with us. We, we posted bond on personal recognizance. Um, and the next day, I had to be arraigned. And went before the judge. And they gave us probation because it was our first um, offense. It was a drug offense. And the, drug, the attorney argued that we had a drug problem. It wasn't that we were bad people. We were in a danger to the community. It's just that we had a problem. We needed help. And that was the beginning of my wake-up call. That was when I started to realize I have a felony charge on my record now. Getting a job is going to be almost impossible, right? So I'm looking at it going, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a felony on my record that will be expunged when I stay out of trouble for the next two years. But at the same time, I've been locked up in a cell. I know what that feels like now. Even though they were really good to me there, like a lot of the cops, a few cops I knew, but a lot of the cops knew them. They were cool to us because of them. And they were just like, they got a problem. And the cop that arrested me, his sister was a recovering heroin addict and she died. And he was talking to me on the way to the jail being like, it's not too late for you, bro. I know you can pull yourself out. It's like, I know you, you'll be okay. But you got to pull your head out of your ass. Like, And he would send other um, police officers to talk to me. This one lady that worked there, one lady cop came up and said, do you ever think about being a police officer? And I'm like, look at me. I'm in a fucking jail cell for drugs. Like, what the hell? Like, they were really good at trying to push the positivity, but I was locked in the cage, right? So that was, you didn't have anywhere to go. So it was like, this is your life if you don't turn it around. That was rock bottom for me. That was seeing that I had no money left, right? I was working, I was still working. I was completely functional. I was working a job. I wasn't as bad as Callum. I was working a job. My girlfriend was working a job. People knew we were fucked up, but they didn't know how bad it was until at that point. And here I am in a jail cell. And most of my other friends are either dead or in jail. And my good friends that are not involved in this shit have distanced themselves from me that are not even around anymore. So when you put it all together, where is my life? In a fucking jail cell with no friends, family, addicted to drugs. Like, that's where I'm at. And that was like a big wake-up call. It even took me time after that to get myself clean because, like, it was it was a process. Like, my mom actually called um, this rehab center in Newport, Rhode Island. They're like, we don't have a bed for him. So she was, like, all flustered because she's like, what the hell is he supposed to do? He's finally saying, I need help. I want help. You can't put him in there? They're like, no. So eventually we found ARI, the Addiction Recovery Institute, which is an outpatient rehab. And I went into there. And the first day I walked in, 230 pounds. I said, I need to see the doctor. The lady like looked behind me. She goes, did you bring somebody with you? I said, no, it's for me. And she was like, I was 230 pounds, clean shaven. You know, my clothes were clean. I wasn't your typical heroin addict. I wasn't your typical drug addict. But here I was standing there and I just submitted and said, it's time for me to do this. Because I've lost pretty much my family, my friends, all my money. Her, me and my girlfriend, her and I are going to die. We're going to wind up locked in one of those fucking cages for doing this behavior. Like, this has to stop. And I talked to her about it. She didn't want to stop. We had to separate. My whole life had to be uprooted, flipped upside down, and turned around in order for me to get clean. Like, I had to walk away from everything. I had to literally just take my entire life and fold it inside out and submit and say, I'm fucked. I can't do this on my own. I need help. I need to be away from everybody. I need to do this for myself or this is where I'm headed. That's where Callum's at. So although Nick's heart is in the right place, if Nick was taking care of Callum, he would die. That's that's all there is to it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's how it works. How do I know how it works? Because it's the same fucking thing. Matter of fact, even go watch those intervention shows. If you watch those shows called Intervention, everything I'm saying right now that I've lived is true. That's why I like to watch them. It's a good reminder of my life. And the fact that I know, even though it's reality TV, which people think it's scripted, that stuff is real because I've lived through it. Those people, I the pain in their faces, that's real. The people enabling them, the people getting clean, all that shit is real, right? So be aware, guys. Here's the deal. There's going to be some people that think that, like Nick Trujillo, that the parents are too harsh. You don't understand. And that's the problem. 99% of people out there don't understand what enabling is. They think they can handle it. It's like anything else. If you didn't know how to fix a car and something breaks in your car... 
Would you go out there with no experience, no direction, no anything with a screwdriver, open the hood and start poking around with a screwdriver to see what fucking moved and what you could do? No. Why? Because you might puncture something, make it worse, and then the car doesn't run or the car dies, right? Exactly. That's exactly what happens when people go, oh, I need to take care of this. There's a movie called Train Spotting with Ewan McGregor in it where they lock him in the room. He, he dries out from heroin for a certain period of time. That motherfucker goes right back to doing shit later on. So it, it's not about just drying someone out and getting them clean and being there for them. That person has to work on the reason. There's something that happened to Callum that is so painful. And I guarantee you it's a, an accumulation of things that we've seen the last couple of years. So we've seen him kind of go off the rails little by little until he's here. This has been happening right in front of our faces, but we don't know his psyche. We don't know how he feels inside emotionally. We don't know if these things have triggered other things in, to, in his past that are manifesting them to act this way now. We have no idea. But the thing is, there's something that's making Callum act like this. There's something that's affecting him to the point where he wants to just self-destruct. And if the parents try to help him, the friends try to help him, it's going to happen even faster. He's not going to make it. So this is the only way. Now, unfortunately, he's so far gone with these drugs that he jumped out of a window and landed. I'm pretty sure it was on the cement the way he landed because that tree that was in the picture Nick put up, he didn't land on that tree because he wouldn't have hurt his spine like that. He would have hit that, fumbled around, maybe hit his head or something. But I think he had to hit that cement pretty damn hard to, to fracture his spine or whatever the fuck he did with the spinal injuries. But jumping through that fucking window, and I'm also not so sure that, you know, Nick's reporting, well, those people that were chasing him or something, we don't know if people were chasing him. When you're on drugs, you are not thinking straight. You literally could have been sitting there. He could have been sitting there doing meth. And his friend, of course, if he's staying at his friend's house and he's high on meth and he's got a drug problem, his friend could have been involved with meth too. And he could have been like, oh, I could jump out that window. His friend could have been like, no way. And he takes a big hit of meth and goes, ah, and then jumps out the fucking window. Like people do shit like that all the fucking time on drugs. You don't think straight. Like there's so much more that could be going on behind the scenes with this thing that we don't know. But I can tell you this right now. I've been in Callum's shoes. I've been Callum. Okay. I've been two seconds away from doing something that either harmed or killed someone else or harmed or killed myself many times. Okay. And his parents are not going to fix it. So be aware, guys, this is a road of self-destruction that he's on. I'm telling you right now, I don't know what's going to happen. He's in the hospital. He's sedated. He's in a coma, spinal injuries. I don't know what happens from here. I don't know if he wakes up. If I mean, they put you to sleep specifically, in his case, probably for two reasons. Probably to go through the detox that he's going through. And you can you can medical detox where they put you under like a, an anesthesia for a couple of days and you detox. But the problem is his body needs to heal. And he needs to not move around. Meaning if he's awake and he moves around, he's not going to heal. So I also wonder if anything happened to his brain. Because they do that also. They'll put you under sedation to see if your brain heals. Like put you in a deep sleep, in a coma. To see if your brain heals. And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the body heals, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the trauma that's going on. And how bad you know that trauma is. There's a lot of things that they don't understand about the body. So it's like, this is the protocol we have. This is the, what we're hoping for. But... This could go in totally the opposite direction. He could be brain dead. He could be paralyzed. He could be this. He could not wake up. Like, we don't fucking know. And doctors will tell you there's a chance of this, chance of that. They just don't fucking know. So just like Piano, when he was in a coma, they were like, he could wake up. He could not. They kept him on life support. They didn't say, well, you know, he's so far gone. We can't put him on life support. They revived him. They got him to where he was alive. They put him on life support, said, let's see if his brain heals. And it didn't, right? Everybody hoped for the best, but it didn't. So I think that, in essence, we should brace ourselves for another death in the fitness industry callum one of the shy, brightest shining stars that we'd seen in such a long time somebody just had the it factor somebody that had the world wrapped around his finger he literally had the world he had the fitness industry wrapped around his finger he could do his thing be himself do the crazy antics and we just ah that's callum he had everything two years ago and i want to say not that drugs took that away from him he destroyed that he took that away from himself he has made every single decision to get himself in the position he's in right now. Every day you can wake up because I did it. Okay, so I'm speaking from experiences. Don't give me any shit about you don't know, Jerry. Yes, I fucking do. You don't. If you're arguing with me anything about this point, you don't know. Because every day you, you wake up and God gives you that chance to make a decision, you can make a decision to be a new person every single day. I tell everybody, tomorrow's the first day of the rest of your life. You wake up in the morning, you can decide, I'm going to be clean, I'm going to be sober, I'm going to start a business, I'm going to get a dog, uh, I'm going to get married, I'm gonna, whatever. You can, Whatever you decide to do the next day, you literally can change the trajectory of your entire life the next day when you wake up. You wake up with a clean slate. No matter what shit is piled up on your plate, 
When you wake up the next day, you can decide to deal with that stuff in a certain way to get rid of it. You can decide which direction to go in your life. You can decide to make changes. You can decide to be better. You can decide to be worse. You're in control. So he's in control of everything right now, but right now the drugs are controlling him, right? The drugs are, so you have to get the drugs out of that situation. You have to remove the drugs. And the only way that happens is he doesn't want to take them anymore. Meaning he's not in the pain, the anxiety, the depression, whatever's going on that's causing him to do that has to be gone first. And if it's not, he's going to return to those drugs because that's his way out. That's his medication. He is self-medicating. And that's how he's keeping himself sane by making himself insane and not really paying attention or knowing what the fuck is going on or caring because he's putting these drugs in his body. He's putting multiple drugs in his body at this point. It was cocaine and meth. We don't know if he's drinking on top of it, which probably wouldn't even, you know, people wouldn't even think much about it. But cocaine and drinking go together like peas and carrots, right? A little Forrest Gump action here. You throw meth in there. I've seen plenty of people do meth and drink alcohol at the same time. The meth brings you up. The alcohol brings you down. It's like speedballing. They can control themselves back and forth. Smoke a little meth, do a little drinking, blah, blah, blah. Back and forth. That's, that's common too. So I'm looking at this going, I want to hope for the best. Right. I want to say that, you know, be positive, but the odds are stacked extremely high against Callum right now. I'm going to put this out there the way that my counselor actually put this to me. My first day in counseling and rehab, I walked in there and he said, why are you here? And I said, well, I'm addicted to heroin. How long have you been addicted to heroin? I tell him, okay, good. He said, well, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, you're probably not going to make it. I'm like, what? This guy is an old man who used to be a priest, which I never got his story, by the way, which... It was always about me. It wasn't about him. But I really would have loved to know why he left the priesthood. But um, he was much older. He's probably in his 70s or 80s. probably gone now. But he said, you're probably not going to make it. The odds are that you will relapse. And the odds are most likely 50-50 that you'll overdose with that relapse. Or in one of your relapses. Because it's part of the process. He's like, like less than 1% of people stay clean. He's like, and it's like even less than that that stay clean and don't have a relapse. He's like, it's so far and few between, so be aware this is part of the process. And I was like, fuck you. And here it is, 21 years later, no relapses, still clean, and have not even, I'm not saying you don't get these cravings and these weird dreams and stuff, but the whole point is, to be able to do that, I had to make the decision, I'm not going to do that anymore. And that pissed me off. The things he said to me that I can't do it, like that's the worst shit to me back then, back in the day. My ego was so big, like don't tell me I'm not going to do something, because even if I hurt myself, I'll do it. Even and I did, I put myself through withdrawals. I, got, I hurt myself to prove to this guy that I was going to stay clean. And here I am 21 years later and I am. But the whole point is it had to be me. So when I made that decision, I was like, you'll see, you'll see. He said, okay, let's see, show me, show me. Like, you know, he gave me that tough love. And he said, okay, we're going to get to the root of why you're doing this. So we did, we dug. My cousin Christopher's death and being molested as a kid are two things when combined made me go off the fucking rails. Learning what those things did to me, how they trigger me, how to deal with them and new tools to deal with them is what keeps me clean. That and never wanting to go through withdrawals again. But at this point, Callum's so deep in it, he's not thinking. He's really not thinking. Like he could lose everything and still just go grab the grab the friggin' meth pipe and hit it again, not even think twice. Right? And that's where he's at. So be aware, guys. I do I just I don't see this ending in a good way. I'm gonna say that I would say a prayer for him and say that I wish he does clean everything up because he could have the biggest comeback story you know of the entire fitness industry that we've ever had you know beating drugs and coming back it would pro probably propel him propel him to even bigger heights and higher heights than he was before if he beats us comes back and gets his shit back together it, it'd be the most incredible rocky balboa story in the history of fucking mankind but the odds of that happening are less than one percent and right now being in the hospital damaged spine a lot of damage has been done already he's got to face the court and the, the, the laws he's broken in Australia and America both, just because you're paralyzing on drugs doesn't mean they wipe those laws clean. If he's in a wheelchair, his ass still has to go to court and he has to pay for the crimes that he committed. Which means if he has to go to prison for doing the shit that he did or he has to pay giant fines or whatever, be on probation or whatever, not be able to travel, that's what's going to happen. And then he's going to have to be extradited to America. I don't even know how that works at this point to face the drug charges he had here, which are felony drug charges he had here. So even if he gets out of this with his life, he's going to go through a major life change, right? After the injury, who knows if this does nerve damage to where he can't even train anymore, right? Or even walk anymore, whatever the case may be. But then he has to face these major legal battles on top of it, on top, you know, and what's going to happen is when the judge sees him and says, you did all this stuff and then jumped out of a fucking window after your parents disowned you, like your parent and the parents are going to have to testify, Right? They're going to have the parents go in there and say this, that, and they could maybe agree not to, but 
The whole point is there's so much shit that should be piled up right on top of this that will just weigh on him that the first thing he's going to want to do is grab that fucking meth pipe and get high again. No matter how long he's been clean, the first thing he's going to do, because this shit's going to be piled so high, is get high to try to forget about it again. So it's going to be like the ultimate test. So I do not see this going well whatsoever for him in any way, shape, or form unless he has that less than 1%. You know, we talk about the 5 percenters. Less than 1% in him, which you don't know you have. I believe everybody does have that in them, but you don't know you can exercise that or activate that until you do. Most people don't even know it exists in them. We're, all human beings have that. It's called willpower, free will, common sense, reasoning. All those things are inside us that can be activated to get through this. But does he know that he has that? That's the question. So be aware, guys. I do think that Nick Trigilli's video comes from the right place. And Nick has got the biggest heart. He really does. Like He wants to help everybody. He, I think he truly does care about people. And he can't fathom why some of these people self-destruct and do the shit that they have when you know they have everything around them. But that's the whole point. It's not about what you have. It's not about what you do. It's about what's in here and what's in here. When that shit collides and causes that storm, you get Callum. Biosetraining at gmail.com. Leave comments down below, but don't fight. Bunching.com is a blog. It's the Callum Get Well Bicep. There it is. And we are out.